So good afternoon. It's been a long day, a lot of really interesting talks. What I want to do is describe this project I've been working on for uh, about 17 years now uh, at the South Pole. And um, one of the things I realized as I started thinking about this presentation is that I made the mistake, right, of thinking that everybody sees the same thing and then they interpret it based on their experiences. But what I realize now is what you see depends on what your experiences have been. So what I want to do today is try to describe to you how I think, and hopefully then you will be able to understand better what I see with this project. Okay? So <clears throat> if you're a dancer, what you see is a stage, right? No matter where you are. Okay? So this is one of our um, research scientists. <laughs> okay? And he was a professional uh, dancer for about a decade before he got into physics. Okay? What a physicist sees when they look at something is a detector. Okay? And so um, what we wanted to do was detect a nearly invisible particle called the neutrino. And the idea is easy. right? And what I like to say is the idea is the last easy thing as well. So here's the idea. We have a blue line representing an invisible particle called the neutrino. There are something like 100 trillion neutrinos per second going through each one of you every second. Okay? They do absolutely nothing, n less impact than light going through glass. But once in a while, for you, about once every 100 years, right? if you happen to live that long, a neutrino will knock into an atom just right and it will disappear and out will come a charged particle. When that charged particle goes through a clear medium, it creates light. So what we have to do is put in light sensors in a grid in order to attract or in order to detect that light. So I'm just gonna tell you right now what I just said makes all the sense in the world. Okay? That was like I was like, how how could I have said that any better? Because I think about this a lot, <laughs> and if I could say it better, I would. So what I know is, for many of you, that made no sense whatsoever, OK? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn you all into a detector, OK? So um, what we're going to do is you're not only going to be the detector, but you're going to be, be the disturbance, OK? And I have a great deal of confidence we can pull this off because they do this at sports games, OK, you know, <laughs> in stadiums. So what we're going to do is uh, do the wave, but we won't stand up. We'll just do it with our hands, OK? Because we're dignified, right? This, isn't, <laughs> this, this is not a sports stadium, OK? So we'll just start in the front row here, right? And what we want to do is on three, we'll have the people in the front row put their arms up and bring them down. And then when they come down the second row, you put your arm up and come down like that, OK? Maybe we could get the lights up again, so just so people can see this, OK? All right. so. One, two, three. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think you're thinking too much here. Okay. Um, so um, I, somehow spontaneously in, in football stadiums this works. But okay. So here's the problem we have in science, though. Right? Is nobody will give us enough money to put a detectors as close together as you're sitting. Okay? And if we want to measure something that's going to go all the way to the back of the room, the reality is we don't need that many detectors. Okay? So we're going to try this again, even though it was only marginal, to be honest here. <laughs> okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to take out every other row. Right? So, um, so the first row would be the first row. The second row would be the second row. Right? The second row, you're done. Okay? And we're going to take out every other person. Right? Okay, so we'll start um, from the outside and go in, just every other person. It doesn't matter if you screw this up, but we'll just try it, okay? And what I want to show you is even if not everyone participates, we can still see a pulse go to the back of the room, right? We could still measure that, okay? So let's try it again about every other person, every other row, and on three, we'll start in the front and we'll see a disturbance go to the back, okay? All right, one, two, three, okay? All right, yeah? All right. <laughs> all right, now, here's the problem we have. We have all these light sensors down there. And while this is shown as this, like, 
you know, super luminal glow there that these light sensors could never miss. In fact, very little light is produced by these particles going through the ice. So even though the light sensor is sitting there, it turns out that um, very few of them see light. And so what we're going to do one last time is now only the people whose birth date, right, is between one, their birthday is between one and five, right? So that's like May 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, but any month of the year or 5th, okay, are going to participate, right? So we're going to try this one last time, all right? So again, on three, we'll start from the front and go to the back, right? And only if your birth date's in the first five days of the month are you going to go, okay? So one, two, three, okay? So you see, even with just a few of you doing this, right, we can still tell there was a disturbance that went to the back, right, and we can measure it. So that's basically what we do when we design a detector like this, is we have to figure out how big is the disturbance, right, and then how much money do we have, so how densely can we instrument that, okay? All right, so what did we do? We actually built the biggest science detector that's ever been constructed anywhere in the world. We drilled 86 holes in the ice. The distance from one hole to another is 125 meters, more than a football field apart. One of the big challenges I have with these talks is conveying to people how big this detector is, but this is the Eiffel Tower to scale, okay? So the, the distance, it's about eight Eiffel Towers to the bottom of the detector, okay? And the bottom 1,000 meters has actually got these light sensors in it. 60 of them. And the light sensors are actually so far apart, if we put one vertically, if we put one at the front of the room, the next one would be at the back of the room, okay? So even though it looks like there's lots and lots of dots down here, right, and those light sensors, they're actually really far apart, and they are about the size of a basketball, you can see. So if you can imagine being at one end of a football stadium, and then looking at the other end and trying to find a, a basketball, that's, that's about how far apart these light sensors are. And so um, here's a team of people putting down one of the light sensors in the ice, um, and then this is a downhole view of what that looked like. Okay? So this was an incredible project. It took, um, uh, as I say, I've been working on this for about 17 years. This part of the project um, got funded in 2002, and then it took uh, seven years of work at the South Pole because we could only work three months at a time in order to construct that. So one of the things that made it um, successful was uh, the wide range of talents that contributed to this. And so I just wanted to point out, this was such a great accomplishment. This was the 5,160th light sensor that was being deployed, the very last one, that the Swedish um, collaborator almost expressed some emotion. Did you see? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what does the detector do? Here, here again is our invisible particle going through the detector, not making any light, and then it knocks into an atom, and it creates a shock wave of light. If you think about like um, a boat going through the water, but this is in three dimensions, so it's like a cone. And then the way we represent what's going on is if one of the light sensors sees some light, we color it in and then just visually so that you can kind of get a feel for the direction by just looking at a static picture. The first ones start off red and they end up blue, right? So even if we didn't have the light um, or that, that line going through there, if we just showed the picture, you'd understand what was going on, I hope, okay? So again, the challenge is this. That doesn't look so big, right? But what I want to do is, by the end of this talk, be able to convince you that this thing's really huge and these events that we're measuring are really incredible, okay? So what is it that would be producing particles that would um, cause us to invest so much of our time and effort to build this great big detector, right? Well, here is an example, okay? And, you know, I know a lot of you are thinking, like, I'm not really a scientist. I don't know how much I can get out of this talk, but let's just try this. One of these pictures is the actual data, and the other one is an artist's conception, okay? <laughs> okay, so any, anyone tell which is which? 
<laughs> okay, but I put the artist conception in there because um, the, the important thing is these events that we're looking for are the biggest explosions that occur in the universe. The good news is the universe is huge and mostly empty, okay? And so that means very extreme things can happen on a daily basis or more, and it doesn't wipe out everything on Earth, okay? If this happened in our galaxy, we'd all be gone, okay? That's how powerful these are. This particular event, which is this is the real event here, if you went back a day, there would be nothing showing at this location, occurred 12 billion light years away. It occurred about one and a half billion years after the universe was started as we understand it now. So in order for us to see it, it had to produce a tremendous amount of energy and these particular kind of events we think don't send all their energy out in all directions like starlight, but send it out in a beam like this. So that's good because it concentrates so it makes it more likely that we're going to see what's going on. Okay. So <clears throat> what happens is the energy of the particles produced in these big explosions is not all the same. Sort of like our economic environment now. Okay. We have a few people who get lots and lots of money, right? And then as you go further down, in incomes, you get more and more people, right, earning those incomes. So a few particles get phenomenally high amounts of energy. And in particular, the ones we're looking for, these neutrinos, have this amazing property. Not only do they get it, but they keep it. And they keep it until they give it up all at once. So they are great messengers for telling us what happened when they were created. Okay. They don't spend any money along the way, right? When they, when they give up their money, you know exactly how much they had when they, when they got it, okay? So um, <clears throat> this is a simulation that shows you what happens on a microscopic scale because one of these particles comes in and then it interacts and it creates light. And so these lines are representing the paths of lights. This is a simulation. And if one of those paths of lights happens to hit one of our light sensors, then it gets colored in. Okay? So it's this really quite incredible thing that's going on. Most of the light does nothing at all because remember our sensors are really far apart. Okay? <clears throat> the other thing is that the ice is not perfect. So if you look at these, you see sometimes the light goes like this and then bends like that, right? Okay? So just like when you take people on a trip, what, what that means is some of these people that went on the trip, their stories are not reliable, right? <laughs> because they might go on these crazy things like that and then when they show up might be at a time that makes no sense compared to all the other light. Okay? So there are many things that make this challenging, but basically what we end up with is this pattern of light that we try to determine basically two things, maybe three. We try to determine which direction the particle came from and how much energy it had, and then by the pattern of light we can actually tell um, uh, what type of particle created it. So I just wanted to point out the time scale there, this whole event, which if it was run in real time, would have taken 250 billionths of a second, okay? So the amazing thing is we put these sensors down on the ice, right, and they can keep track of those things like that, okay? This happens with these very high energy things about once a month, okay? So you might think this is kind of a boring place, right? Um, <clears throat> because you got to sit around once a month, you see this great big um, uh, explosion of light in the detector. So again, just to try to reinforce just how much light is seen, this is the lakefront in Madison, right? If I overlay to scale the amount of light that's detected, this is to scale how big those events are, right? Just mind-bogglingly big, okay? And so, so since we only see once one a month, um, then we can name them after Muppets, right? So the first two <laughs> looked about the same, so they were Bert and Ernie, right? There's one that has even more energy. That's called uh, Big, uh, Big Bird. So the problem isn't that there isn't anything going on. In fact, 3,000 times a second, 
a particle goes through the ice. Okay? The problem is most of them aren't the particles we're looking for. So this um, really confusing um, collection of paths of particles going through represents what you would see in 10 milliseconds, one one hundredth of a second if you're down on the ice. Okay? So what we have to do is sort through all that stuff and try to find these um, one particle a month, right? That's these very high um, energy neutrinos. So how do we do that? Well, the same way if you're getting too much light, right? <coughs> what you do is put on sunglasses, only believe it or not, what we do is use the Earth as our sunglass. So we look up through the Earth because these neutrinos are the only particles we know that can come through the Earth. So not only did we build this crazy detector that looks like for these nearly invisible um, particles, but we're doing this bizarre thing of looking through the Earth at the heavens. Okay. <clears throat> so in order to know we're looking up through the Earth, we have to know with some confidence that when we say something came from a particular direction, we know that we're seeing, we have confidence in that, right? So um, nobody's ever built a detector like this, so we had to come up with a way to ensure that we are doing it. So this is, I like this just aesthetically, this, this plot here. This is actually showing us that the moon is in the right place, okay? And so what we do is the moon is going around like this, and it doesn't create particles, but it blocks particles. So we see a slight deficit from where the shadow of the moon, believe it or not, from these particles coming from outer space. Okay? And so by the fact that that shows up in one spot means that we're tracking things properly. Okay? So um, I would like to show you um, a very cool graphic right, that maps out um, what these objects that I showed you at the beginning look like in outer space, but that's not what our telescope produces. What our telescope produces is individual locations where these particles appear to have come from. And so the hope is that we'll be able to um, find individual places that are producing enough of these neutrinos to understand how they get these tremendously high energies. Okay? This is a large collaboration, and it's been uh, really enjoyable to be involved with. There's now 44 institutions. Um, UWRF was one of the uh, charter institutions. Um, there's about 18 in the US, three or four in Canada, and then uh, Europe, um, Japan, New Zealand, um, and then um, South, Carolina, or, uh, South Korea. So, um, so I think, uh, hopefully you understand a little bit better about how scientists think and maybe what it is what I see when I look at these pictures. Thank you.